go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised you. All I want 
is all you are Will you meet me here again? Again and again and again You're welcome in this place your presence fill this place oh. Cause I'm not enough Unless you come Will you meet me here again Cause all I want Is all you Not enough Unless you come Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want Is all you are Will you meet me here again? Hey Hill City, welcome to Church at Home. We're always so glad when you carve out time to join us on whatever day you're watching. Yeah, it's gonna be a great day, gonna be a great time. Uh, we've got really one thing that we wanna highlight um, kind of happening in the life of our church and we wanna make sure that you're a part of it. It's that time, it is back to school. Yeah. Are we happy or are we sad? Yes. Maybe both. But as a church, we all always want to come alongside our community. So we are partnering this year, as we did last year, yep. with Naomi Brooks Elementary. Yep. And so it's going to be real simple. We've got an Amazon wish list set up where you can simply go see the supplies that are needed, and then it'll come directly to the church. Yep. And we'll gather them all together and we'll deliver them uh, to the school. Uh, we love uh, the generosity of our church. Because of your generosity, because of your faithfulness, your obedience to God's word, um, we're able to do outreaches like this, ministries able to go forward for you and for your family. Uh, and we are excited to see all that God's doing. Uh, the name of Jesus is being lifted up. And here's what I love about the promise of the Bible. Jesus said that if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men uh, unto me. So what we're wanting to do is do the best of the light that we've been given. We wanna be that city on a hill and church, you're doing that. And so as we partner with this school, as we help them uh, really launch out into the year great, uh, we know that the name of Jesus uh, is being glorified. And so church, thank you again uh, so much. I want you to grab your Bible, I want you to grab your notepad, uh, because Pastor Matt has got a word for us as we wrap up our series uh, in uh, the Spirit. Hey, Hill City Church, it is so good to be with you today. Uh, welcome to church at home. Uh, if I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Matt, I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, and just honored that you would spend some time with us. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna honor our uh, pastors, uh, Pastor Charlie and Pastor Nicole, just so thankful for them, their life and their leadership, uh, just their investment in this church body, just so thankful for that. Well, we are continuing on in our series all about the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we really hope that this has been impactful, impactful for you as we've been trying to discover where is the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Where do we see him in the Old Testament? Where do we see him in Jesus? Where do we see him in the early church? Uh, and today we're gonna spend some time looking at where's the Holy Spirit in Paul's writings. Paul, one of the apostles, one of the leaders of the church, uh, the, really the early church, he had a lot to say about the Holy Spirit. So really just kind of trying to explore what is Paul trying to say about the Spirit? Uh, if you got your Bible, open up to Romans uh, chapter 8. We're going to start there, so put a finger there, and also uh, on Galatians 5. So Romans chapter 8 and Galatians uh, chapter 5. So let's read this, starting in verse 9. We're just going to read a couple of verses. It says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, talking to, again, this church, the people of God. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. 
If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies uh, through his spirit who dwells in you. Paul has this tendency uh, to kind of ramble on a little bit and try to hit a certain word count like you would in school, uh, where he just needs a few words. He kind of makes out a lot of words, but uh, we're going to explore that in just a second. We're also looking at Galatians 5, uh, starting in verse 16, a little bit longer, but stay with me. It says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let's go ahead and pray today. Jesus, we are thankful for your word. And we want to be open to your Spirit. Lord, speak to us today as uh, we are ready to hear this message. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. So now everything is streaming sites for TV. It's Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu. Uh, But back in the day, there used to be just a slew of commercials on every channel. You didn't get the luxury of kind of skipping through things. You really had to kind of sit and wait for commercials to happen. Um, Those were all kind of fun. There were some fun commercials. But one of my favorites was an infomercial. Like there is nothing like falling asleep on the couch and waking up at 2 a.m. to a sham wow commercial. The people that were selling those things were always so passionate and you actually had the thought, I actually may need that in my life. I remember seeing one of these commercials about this pack of probably seven or eight knives uh, and they looked really interesting. Uh, But right before they got to the end of the infomercial, the person selling it said, but wait, there's more. They talked about the case that they come in. Well, you can't have the knives without the case. So I need the case. I need to go ahead and get that. And right before the sale ends, they would say, wait, there's more. And now you can get the knife sharpener too. Well, what good are dull knives? I need that knife sharpener also. And they would get to the end, but wait, there's more. There's this bone cutting knife. I don't even know what I would use that for, but just include it all in. They would always get to these uh, to the end of these infomercials, and the product that they started with was so much bigger and more grandiose than what they started with. Sometimes when I think about our spiritual lives and our lives of following Jesus, I wish I could say to a lot of us, but wait, there's more. You said Jesus often talked about this idea of an abundant life, a fullness of life, a vitality of life. And if we're honest, many of us feel like our walk with Jesus, we often have these moments where we feel hollow and our spirituality feels like it's superficial or surface level. And what I've found for many of us is we lack vitality in our walk with God often because we're not willing to befriend the Holy Spirit. See, Pastor Charlie did an awesome job last week talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. And I absolutely believe in that. I love the fact that the Holy Spirit wants to move in our churches, how he wants to bring life to our churches. I actually think the next great move of God in our world is not going to be based off of talents and skills of certain preachers or worship leaders. It's going to be based off a need and a hunger for the Holy Spirit. But I think it's often easy for us to believe in the Holy Spirit moving in our church, but hard for us to believe that the Holy Spirit can move in the same way in our own personal mundane lives. See, it's easy for us to believe that the Holy Spirit is moving during the third song of a worship set on a Sunday when the chord changes. It's hard for us to believe that the Holy Spirit's working when we're sitting in traffic. 
It's easy for us to believe that the Spirit is working at the altar call and I'm getting prayed for. It's hard for us to believe that the Spirit is working when my kids are acting up and things just feel crazy. And so for many of us, we actually keep the Holy Spirit at bay as something that we can kind of control so as not to let it get too close to us because we struggle to understand him. There was a professor, his name was uh, Gordon Fee. And you're gonna hear me reference him a couple times because he's kind of a leading New Testament thinker about Paul and his view of the Holy Spirit. He had a student come up to him one time and the student said, God the Father, I understand. Christ the Son, I know. But the Holy Spirit is a gray oblong blur. Doesn't feel like that sometimes. Like what are we supposed to do with the Holy Spirit? And then based on your background, that will often determine how you view the Spirit. For some of us, we view the Spirit even as unspiritual or unchristian, and at best for some of us, as unhealthy. See, depending on your background, it'll determine how you view the Holy Spirit. So maybe you have a background that says that the Spirit was active when the church started in the book of Acts. But after the church got started, it wasn't really needed anymore, and the Spirit kind of faded away over time. Some of us only associate the Spirit with extravagant. And so we think of the Spirit in terms of healing, speaking in tongues, the prophetic. And for some of us, we love that world. And for other of us, maybe you grew up in a liturgical background, all of that frightens you and scares you, and you may even view that as an unchristian thing. And if we're honest, a city like D.C., many of us view ourselves as intellectuals and we view the spirit as only for the weak and those who need a crutch, not just for me. Please please hear me on this. If you don't get anything else today, please hear this, that the only way to have a right relationship with the Holy Spirit is to have a right view of the Holy Spirit. And that means doing an inventory of how do I view the Spirit? See, the problem with all those previous examples is that they are a singular perspective, not a whole perspective. I remember one time I was in the car with my wife and uh, she hit a level of what I would call hangry. Um, And we've all been there. Hangry, if you're not familiar, means you're hungry and angry at the same time. And let me tell you, that is a powerful force that can do destruction uh, on the whole city. She wanted me to remind you uh, after I asked her if I could share the story that she was pregnant, but I don't feel like that's relevant to the story. Uh, But my wife was uh, hangry one day and we had to kind of do all these errands. And I could tell she was getting hangry. And she said, I just can't, I just want to get these done with uh, and then go home. I was like, no, I think we should probably stop for some food. She said, I don't want to stop. Let's just get this done and go home. I said, nope, we're stopping for food. Stopped for food. And literally 10 seconds later, after she's biting into something, man, I feel pretty good. Let's hang out after we do these errands. Like, this sounds like a fun day. Now, imagine that I judged her solely on that one moment of being hangry. That's not the whole of who my wife is. And I would hope that she doesn't do the same to me. See, for many of us, we view the Holy Spirit only as one slice of the pie when the picture, the whole, bu- the whole pie, is much bigger than you or I. So our view of, the, of uh, the Holy Spirit, in order to have a right view of the Holy Spirit, we must have a right relationship with the Holy Spirit. We often have this skewed view of the Spirit. There was a study that went out across America, and it was asked, how do you view the Spirit? of Americans said they view the Holy Spirit as a force. In other words, think Star Wars, like a force to be wielded or a force to kind of be conjured up. Please hear me. The Holy Spirit is both a person and a presence with power, not some kind of incantation that we can recite when we need an extra dose of something. No, the Holy Spirit is a person in a presence with power, which means we can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You often hear the language today of manifesting things. I think this is often what people are talking about. They're thinking of a power to be wielded. Well, our faith uh, does not say that the Holy Spirit is some kind of force to be wielded, but a person to have a relationship with. 
It's a spirit that is active in creation, present in the Old Testament, depended upon by Jesus in the New Testament, the source and kind of foundation of the church, and it is the spirit that is leading us and guiding us today. Now, Paul has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit. He only wrote 13 letters, but he references the Spirit 149 times because he sees the Spirit as an indispensable part of the Christian life. In other words, you can't be a follower of Jesus if you also are not a Spirit person. Gordon Fee, the same scholar, says it this way, spirituality without the Holy Spirit becomes a feeble human project. Another way to say it is this, uh, shallow or even hollow spirituality is what will result when our spirituality is based off of effort and not the spirit. What do I mean by all this? Let me give you an example. If you ever woken up and you woke up a little bit later uh, than you wanted to, but you knew, you know what, I got to get kind of some time in the Bible today. So you open your version app after making your French press coffee uh, and you go to a daily reading you read it real quick, about five minutes. You're like, man, that was, that was really good. You check it off, and then you kind of get ready for the rest of your day. You're a follower of Jesus, so you're like, let me just play some worship music in the car. So you get in the car, and of course there's traffic because we live in the D.C. area. Uh, but you're like, you know, okay, I'm all right today. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to follow Jesus but then you get into that first meeting and it feels like that first meeting is all about you and it's critical and all of a sudden all this insecurity is starting to bubble up inside of you, which leads to anger. And then you go with your coworker to lunch and you vent. Another way of venting is also called gossiping. And so you vent to your coworker, uh, which just feeds your anger even more. So the rest of the day, there's kind of this residual anger that you have. Then of course you have your drive back in the traffic back home and that just kind of sets you over the edge. So you get home and spend the rest of your day eating your way or Netflixing your way into some sort of numbness. What happened? We compartmentalize God into a portion of our day rather than letting the Holy Spirit, Spirit do a deep internal work within us. See, if we're not careful, the spiritual disciplines become exterior acts and we never let the Spirit do the internal work. The Lord, the Spirit wants to shift our inner disposition towards God. And so it is a deep internal work that the Spirit wants to do. Really quickly with the time we have left, I want to show us just a couple of pictures that Paul shows us of how he sees the activity spirit. And I want to start with Romans uh, 8 verse 9. This is the first thing that we read. And you can write this down. This is picture number one. Picture number one, the Spirit is with the follower of Jesus. The Spirit is with the follower of Jesus. The second part of that verse, verse 9, says something really interesting. If anyone does not have the Spirit, that person does not belong to Christ. So reverse engineer that. What does it uh, mean to belong to Christ? It means to have the Spirit. So the people of God, saved through Jesus, have been given the life-giving Spirit. Okay, so why does this matter? Hear me here. Follow me here. Many of us were taught that salvation is only justification. By justification, I mean being justified or forgiven for your sins. So when you accept Christ, you were told, I've been forgiven of my sins. Because I've been forgiven my sins, now I can spend eternity in heaven. That's not untrue, but it's also not the whole story. See, the, when, when we accept Jesus into our lives, it's not just the forgiveness of sins, it's also the indwelling of the Spirit. In other words, Jesus did not die so, just so that your sins could be wiped clear. He also sent his Spirit to now live within you so that you can be empowered to live the life God called you to live. Gordon Fee says this, salvation originates in the Father's redeeming love it is in Christ brought about by his death and resurrection, and it is realized in the life of the believer of, by the Holy Spirit, the empowering presence of God. In other words, 
Salvation is not just something where I get out of jail free now. Salvation is something where I am now empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit. He fills us the moment that we accept Jesus. Other translations of this verse would say, the Spirit has made his home in you, which means we can now rest in the fact that the Spirit is with us. So what are the implications of that? It means you and I are not alone. It means that although sometimes it feels like this journey is like we're isolated and we're trying to figure it all out, God did not just go off to an ethereal place. He sent his own presence to be with you every moment of every day. So because of that, I'm never alone on my journey. The moments of prayer sometimes are not as powerful as other moments, but that does not mean I'm alone. The Spirit is with me the moment I accept Jesus. It also means that I have access to God now. Now think about the Old Testament. Anytime someone wanted access to God, they had to go through the priestly system. Well, now, because the Spirit is with me, I can access God all the time. I can pray at any time. I can ask for forgiveness at any time. I, I can call upon his name at any time, and he is right there with me. The Spirit is with the follower of Jesus. And while that's amazing, it's, it's not the whole thing. It's like a car. We don't just invite the Spirit in, and then he sits in the back seat hoping that we get it right. No, he's active. He's moving. He's dynamic. I want to jump over to Galatians 5, looking at that again. And what we saw uh, was Paul is kind of contrasting these two different sides, the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit. Now, when he says flesh, he's not just talking about skin. He's really kind of talking about an old way of life, a time in our lives where we put our trust in anything other than Jesus, where we put our, our trust in our identity and our works in our career, uh, in our relationship, in our abilities, in our jobs. And when we came into Christ, uh, now our trust and our identity is in Jesus, not in ourselves, our external circumstances. And here's the great dichotomy of the kingdom of God. When we accept Jesus, we are now in the spirit, but also learning to let go of the flesh. And this is a lifelong process. We are totally in the spirit, but learning to let go of the flesh. Thomas Merton uses the language of the true self and the false self. So when we are in Christ, we are our true self, but at the same time, we're learning to let go of our false self. And the spirit doesn't just sit back and hope that we figure it out. Picture number two, the spirit, is work, uh, the spirit transforms the follower of Jesus. The spirit transforms the follower of Jesus. And he does so until we're formed into the image of Christ. I'm so thankful that the Spirit does not leave me in the place that he found me. See, it'd be one thing if the Spirit was just with us and then we were trying to drive this car and hope that it worked. But instead, the Spirit is active and moving and he's teaching us how to drive the car. We're invited into this partnership with the Spirit. And when I say we're invited into this partnership, it's not a 50-50 split. This is probably 90%, 10%. This is like when my three-year-old asks to cook with me and I let him stir the spoon, but really I'm doing all the work. It's the same in our process of transformation. Spirit invites us in to, to participate in the activity that he has going on. And the Spirit is so gentle and kind as he brings things to our awareness as we're ready and able to hear them and work through them. And so I may, in this season of my life, be working through anger that the Spirit has recently convicted me of. And I may start to see the roots and I may start to see how it manifests and I may start to see where it has, where, what all it's tangled to. And I may start to see how it's tied to uh, my family of origin. But as I'm working through that, the Spirit is gentle enough to calmly lead us beside still waters and restore our soul. And it's typically only when we deal with one thing that the Spirit will then uh, introduce other things into our lives because He's a gentle and kind Spirit. 
So Paul shows us how the Spirit is with us at salvation, how the Spirit transforms us and is a life-going process. But not only that, this is picture number three, the Spirit resurrects the follower of Jesus. The Spirit resurrects the follower of Jesus. So when we have been saved and marked by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit then becomes a guarantee of our eventual resurrection into God's future glory. Spirit is leading us into eternity. There's a, a scholar, his name's Timothy George, uh, and he just, he has this awesome quote. Uh, it's a little bit long, but I want you to get this, and it's talking all about the spirit life. He says, where does the believer acquire the resources for this kind of victorious Christian living? Modern religious pedagogy offers many answers. A winsome personality, one's innate abilities, advanced degrees in theological education, special seminars on the higher Christian life, social activism, spiritual psychotherapy, and others. But what's Paul's answer? Paul's answer is the Holy Spirit. Only the Spirit of God, who has made us free from sin and given us new life and re regeneration, can keep us truly free as we experience, through walking in him, the power of sanctification. Another way of saying that word sanctification is the power of being transformed. So with this, we often will have two responses. You may say, you may start to create a works-based faith where I have to do everything I can to get and keep the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna read my Bible and I'm gonna pray just so that the Spirit will be happy with me and so I can keep them around. It's a works-based faith. The other response, and this is probably more millennials and kind of my age group, is to do nothing. We just talked about all the great things that the Spirit does, so let's just sit back and hope that the Spirit does it in my life. I've often found that those two options are neither of the right choice. What I've found often for the Holy Spirit, it's about making room and participating in what the Spirit is already doing. It's about making room and participating in what the Spirit is doing. Back in the 90s, there were these famous WWJD bracelets. Uh, awesome bracelets, super colorful. Everybody had them. If you don't know, WWJD stands for What Would Jesus Do? Let me tell you, that's a great way to live. Great question to ask. You could do a lot worse than asking yourself that question. But it's also an incomplete question because it makes it appear that Jesus uh, it was just kind of this distant person and we shouldn't have, we should just try to do what he did, but he also did it 2000 years ago and how does it relate to now? And I'm not a uh, carpenter from a Galilean village 2000 years ago, how does that work? Well, it's because it's an incomplete question. It's not just what would Jesus do? It's what is the spirit doing that I can participate in? So I wanna kinda of just give us uh, three little handles um, about making room for the Spirit in our lives. Three handles for making room for the Spirit in our lives. And there's a lot more, but these are just three things I found helpful. Number one is about having a posture of humility. Having a posture of humility. R.T. Kendall wrote an awesome book called The Anointing, where he says, what is humility? It is the recognition that I don't have everything and I don't know everything. It is the awareness that I need more of the Holy Spirit. It's often when we in humbly invite the Spirit in that the Spirit does His greatest work. I've noticed that the Spirit really operates as a gentleman where He doesn't just burst down the door whenever He sees fit, but He waits for a humble invitation, an invitation that says, I am in desperate need for the Spirit to move in my life. I think about this, uh, I, the other day I, I went, I took my, my boys to the park and our youngest Peterson uh, fell down and immediately just tears, crying. You got to check his whole body, make sure there's nothing, you know, no blood showing or anything like that. And so then I just, uh, just held him. But my response was so quick. He didn't have to cry for 10 minutes before I like ran over there. My response was so quick. Why? Because it was a cry of need, a cry of humility, a cry of, I can't fix myself. And so I need you to come, uh, come to me. 
Well, that's the kind of cry the Holy Spirit is looking for us to have, a cry of need, a cry of desperation and humility. I need the Spirit in my life. So one is a posture of humility. Number two is posturing our day around the Holy Spirit. Posturing our day around the Holy Spirit. So what's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? So check Instagram, TikTok, check your email. Uh, is it to turn on the news, uh, figure out kind of your only new, your news outlet? Often the first things that we do speak to what we value the most. And so for many of us, uh, we are actually putting things before engagement with the Holy Spirit. When I start my day, I do my best to kind of keep my phone in a separate room. And, and mind you, I by no means am perfect at this. I struggle with it all the time. A lot of times I'm turning on Instagram first thing in the morning, but I do my best to wake up, keep my phone in a separate room, uh, make some, some French press coffee, uh, and then to sit with my Bible, to sit in prayer, to sit in silence, really trying to engage with the Spirit of God. And I think a lot of us know that and a lot of us do it. A lot of us, the problem is later on in the day. We have things that we do in the morning, but what happens for the rest of the day? Well, there's a monastic um, uh, thing that used to happen called the daily office. And the daily office is really just a time to sit with the scriptures, to sit with the spirit and try to hear what the spirit is doing and saying throughout the course of the day. So I have a little book, it's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Day by Day. And I do my best in the middle of the day to open that just to spend five minutes to reorient my mind and my heart around the Holy Spirit. Now, please hear me on this. None of this is to get God to like me more. If anything, the reason I'm doing this is to remind myself that I like God. Often that's the thing that I struggle with. It's not that I don't believe that God loves me. It's just that as my day goes on, I struggle to remember that I love him as well. And so I'm doing these things to reorient my mind and my heart back to the spirit. Number three is this, consider what I'm putting in my mind. Consider what I'm putting in my mind. I didn't read this verse before, but uh, Romans 8, verse 6, it says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. See, many of the things that we're putting into our mind are not inherently wrong, but they're also not helpful. A lot of things are not bad in and of themselves, but they're not actually pointing us to the spirit. I have to think through, what am I reading? What is my uh, social media doing to me? Uh, what about Netflix? All these different things are going to reorient orient my mind in a direction. Is it reorienting my mind towards the spirit or away from the spirit? And before you say, okay, great, like a church saying that like I shouldn't watch certain things and that there's certain rules and legalism, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm actually a big football fan. I'm a Jets fan. Uh, and if you are familiar with the Jets and the NFL, you know that they are terrible. Uh, except for this year. This is going to be our year. Uh, they're always so bad. And so I'll watch Jets games. And then for a couple hours afterwards, I'm just in a terrible mood. And I've literally had this gut check of, is watching these games actually orienting me towards the spirit? Nothing wrong with football. Nothing wrong with watching a game. But perhaps my, with my own immaturity, I need to check the things that are, re, that are orienting my mind. Are they orienting me towards the Spirit or away from the Spirit? The greatest, things that we, the greatest thing we can do, friends, in engagement with the Spirit is to make room for the Spirit and participate in what the Spirit is doing. Now, you may have noticed that for all those pictures we showed before, that they were true for the follower of Jesus. And you may be saying, I want the benefits of the Spirit. The beautiful thing is that the benefits of the Spirit come when we have relationship with Jesus and with the Spirit. And that invitation is for all of us. Friend, today, maybe you aren't following Jesus or maybe you're not following Jesus the way you want to. That invitation is there for you. I'm gonna pray in just a moment for that, but 
Also, maybe uh, you're just looking at your life and you realize you're living much more according to the flesh rather than the spirit. You're reoriented oriented, not towards the spirit, but towards the flesh. If that's you, and I know it's me often, I'd encourage you to do something. And this is not going to feel spiritual, but I promise it is. I want you to do an audit of your day. So take your day and break down everything that you would do in a normal day. And just ask yourself the question as you are making this list of things, is this orienting my mind towards the spirit or away from the spirit? And if it's orienting your mind away from the spirit, what is a practice you can put in play to then shift it to orienting your mind towards the spirit? I would hope that as you would do this audit, that you'll begin to see things uh, of, or areas of your life where we can, in fact, orient our mind towards the Spirit. Well, friends, let's go ahead. Let's, uh, let's pray today. I want to specifically pray for those uh, who are beginning to choose to follow Jesus. Lord, we thank you, and we come humbly before you, knowing that your Spirit is moving and active and alive in our hearts and our minds And we ask that you would help us to be oriented away from the flesh and towards the Spirit. Show us those areas where we've been following more of the flesh than we have of the Spirit. But Lord, we also specifically pray for those who don't don't yet know you. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day where they would be able to uh, confess that Jesus died on the cross and rose again and believe in their hearts. And because of that, they would be saved. And as they're being saved, that the Spirit would would indwell within them. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, everybody say, amen. Church, we love you. We'll see you soon.